Number one, heart disease needs to be thought about as a chronic disease. And number two, we need to be thinking about the physiology that underlies heart disease if we want to treat it as a chronic disease. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So I come from Metagenics. I do our in-house studies there at Metagenics. And I'm also medical director for a small biopharmaceutical startup company that's taking a hops compound down the FDA path for drug development called Kindex Therapeutics. Those are my disclosures. So why are we talking about heart disease? Because if you read some of the papers that are out there at the moment, well, what you would basically find is that heart disease mortality is going down. That's what the papers say. A paper coming out of Ontario in 2007, I believe, basically said that mortality was down by 50%. And they put that down to two things, better control of risk factors, cholesterol's come down, hypertension's better controlled, and also better therapies, both medical and surgical. But stuck into that paper was a little bit of fact. As they did their covariate analysis, they basically noticed that if you happen to be diabetic or if you happen to be insulin resistant, your risk for dying of heart disease had gone up by 6% during those years from the late 90s, well, the late 80s to the early 90s. So the risk is going up for most of the people around. So we're not talking about decreased mortality in heart disease. We're talking about heart disease changing from an acute disease to a chronic disease. And this is a very simple slide saying, are our patients really doing better? We all know that there's a long period of time in which you do not see anything wrong. Like you don't even necessarily see any change in the vessel wall for a long time with an elevated cholesterol. You don't see a change necessarily even with an elevated insulin level. Your blood sugar doesn't go up for a long time even when you have a fasting insulin level that's up. So the physiology has changed before we see static disease markers. You know, way back in the early 1980s, Freeze basically said, we can decrease morbidity with healthy lifestyle. And the suggestion was that if you lived a better life, kind of like what Dan Bootner talks about in his book, The Blue Zones, if you have a healthy lifestyle, have a healthy food plan, exercise, do all those things, maybe we can put off morbidity until the end of our lives. Well, when um, Freeze said that back in the 1980s, he was laughed at. And then from his lab, a prospective study was done over the next 18 years, and Vita from his lab reported in 1998 that you could indeed do this. If you asked people to live a healthier lifestyle, they could delay their morbidity. But we haven't done it. This paper came out in 2011 by Crimmins, and it basically says that despite everything that we've been trying to do, not just for heart disease, but treating all the diseases that we call chronic, there's more disease prevalence, length of life has increased slightly, but morbidity and mortality, if it's defined as having disease and if it's defined as a loss of function, has actually increased from 1998 to 2008. So as practitioners, we're all stuck kind of in the middle, aren't we? We're seeing our office visits go down. We're seeing practice guidelines about what we should and shouldn't do for our patients. You know, we've got to check the box real quick, get the person out the door. But if we keep doing what we're going to do, we're not going to have the outcomes that we want to do. And so we have to make some changes. And I put forth that what we have to do is look at heart disease differently. And we have to because these are the people who need our help. Olshansky came out with a paper in 2006 saying that children born in this decade, the decade of, well, the last decade now, but between 2000 and 2010, they're going to live on average for a shorter period of time than their parents, and they're going to have a one in three chance by the time they grow up of being diabetic because they're going to be obese. So we have to consider these conditions even at this age if we want to make a difference in the long term. 
Now, when I was in medical school, you know, we did a lot of bariatric surgery at the Medical College of Virginia, and there was a lot of belief around the fact that if someone was overweight and standing in front of you and said that they didn't eat very much, that they must be lying to you or lying to themselves. And now we really have changed the way we think about obesity in the last 20 years, but we still think about it as, for many people, and certainly in the lay community, we think about it as a disease of willpower, don't we? We think that people aren't doing enough, they're not willing to make the lifestyle changes, they're not willing to do all of that. But as this paper by Cooney suggests from Randy Jertle's lab, it suggests that there's something more going on. This is that classic agouti mouse study. Maybe many of you are familiar with it. The agouti mouse over here on the left-hand side of the slide has been deliberately inbred to be diabetic. 